Hello, I'm here today to speak about the Boggit. The Boggit is a stalwart of English folklore um, and one of the most famous names to come out of British folklore tradition. The natural question at the beginning, perhaps particularly for people who don't know English folklore, is what on earth is a Boggit? And I thought that I would just give you the technical answer from one of our very best post-war English folklorists, certainly our most famous English post-war folklorist, Catherine Briggs. Catherine Briggs was very keen on what could be called the fairy dictionary approach to folklore. Um, she frequently gathered together different names of folklore beings um, and listed them together, explaining what these different and often very elusive entities were in her mind. This is her definition for Boggit from her very last compilation of English folklore uh, beings. Catherine writes, A mischievous brownie is called a Boggit. Sometimes it is said that a Boggit has a long, sharp nose and a brownie has no nose at all, only two little nostrils. But it seems that when a brownie is teased or misused, he turns into a Boggit and plays all sorts of mischievous tricks on the household and it is very difficult to get rid of him. Now, um, this version of the Boggit that Catherine Briggs gives us is, let's say, some kind of house spirit, house fairy, house goblin. Um, we definitely have a humanoid presence, hence all these rather peculiar references uh, to nostrils and nose. And this spirit is one who lives in relation to the family. This is pretty much the Boggit that you find in popular culture in the post-war period. Um, you will find it in novels, and more recently, you will find it in films, uh, you find it in art, you find it in popular folklore, writing, not least the writing, of Catherine Briggs. Um, and this is the idea of the Boggit that has come down to us and that is often enjoyed, for example, uh, by children in the UK in schools. Um, many ecologically minded projects involve, for example, creating Boggits um, from Play-Doh or from natural objects picked up in the wood. And so in this way, um, what Catherine Briggs writes is correct. This does reflect our modern version of the Boggit. However, if you go back, um, even before the Second World War, but certainly before the Great War, you do encounter over large parts of England the Boggit, but it has nothing to do um, with the definition I've just read out from Catherine Briggs's book. In fact, on some points, that definition could be said to be almost comically wrong. And so perhaps what I'll now do is move on to describing the Boggit that you find in, for instance, the 19th century, where literally hundreds of thousands of words are used to describe that being. First thing to establish, possibly usefully, would be the geography of the Boggit. Um, I'm going to put up now a map um, which shows the regions of Britain that I call Boggitdom. These were the regions where the word Boggit had um, was used in dialect and had a clear meaning in dialect. Um, this map may look a rather throwaway venture, uh, but it's based on four different data sets. Um, trying to pin down exactly where in the 19th century the Boggit was a thing. Um, it took me um, many months to get this map together. And as you can see, there are still a series of question marks. Um, but it's based essentially on the use of Boggit in dialect and fundamentally the use of Boggit in place names. What we see then is a supernatural entity that is referred to in particularly the northwest of England. And the word Boggit, in fact, was especially associated with Lancashire, um, but also the West Riding. This is the western part of Yorkshire. You can see the name creeps down into parts of the Midlands of England. It goes into Derbyshire, um, into Cheshire, um, and even into Nottinghamshire. And interestingly, it's found on the other side of the country in Lincolnshire. So the first thing to say, perhaps, is that Boggid is not in any sense 
a British or English supernatural being in that it covers all the island or all of England. It was a rather specific term um, for a given part of the country, maybe 10%, 15% of England. So what did Boggit mean? Well, Boggit was used traditionally as a generic label to describe any solitary, evil or ambivalent supernatural creature. Now, just to drive this home, I'll give you some examples. Um, in these areas of England, you have in the 19th century many references to shape changers running through the country. The shape changer would have been described as a boggit. Um, you have, of course, references to ghosts within houses or within the grounds of houses. These would have been boggits. You have a series of different female undines or mermaids. Jenny Greenteeth is perhaps the most famous, um, who were credited with murdering people in water, particularly children. Um, these were often described as boggits. Um, you have mm, black dog creatures, some of which pre-announce deaths. These two are boggits. You have will-o'-the-wisps. These would be called boggits. In fact, it might be easier to start at the other end of the spectrum and say, is there anything supernatural that was not in the 19th century in these regions described as a boggit? And the answer for that is, well, perhaps angels. Um, angels were um, just simply too good to be a boggit. A boggit, again, suggests at the very least an ambivalent moral nature, um, but there were also fairies, and this is probably because of fairies' social um, and also their plural forms. Um, there's the idea that a boggit is something on its own. It's, it's a solitary being. Um, and I've never understood the extent to which in other European traditions this division between the social supernatural and the solitary supernatural um, is important, but in England it, it is an absolutely fundamental dividing line and you can break down the supernatural in the country into these social supernatural traditions and then by their side these more solitary supernatural traditions. Now what this means is if, if you had been living near say Leeds or Manchester in 1880 and someone had come running through the door at 11 at night and said oh my god I've just seen a boggit. Your first question would be not where or when, but what? Because a boggit just covered so many different possibilities. Um, and so in this sense, when we talk about boggits, what we're doing is just, again, giving this generic label um, to a much richer ecosystem of the supernatural. Now, I, I've just completed a book on the Boggets for University of Exeter Press. It's entitled The Boggit, um, and it looks at place names, landscape, dialect, and above all, folklore from the 19th century. And one of the points I make in this book is if you write 300 pages on Boggets, you're not studying an individual supernatural being, like, say, the Banshee, which has a, a very strong set of um, characteristics. Um, you're, studying, you're studying a much wider zoo of the supernatural. It's not me coming up to an individual cage or an aquarium and pointing out a being or a creature. It's me saying, we're studying this entire set together. And what I'd like to do over... The next hour or so is talk about um, the way that this very natural definition of the supernatural, this generic label, um, has been honed down into the house goblin um, that became famous later on in English tradition. So for me, the real challenge is to understand how we get from this very reasonable generic label, Boggit, where Boggit refers, as I said, to this entire ecosystem of the solitary supernatural um, in parts of England, to a point where Boggit has become the goblin, the house fairy, the house spirit that dwells with the family. How, how, do, we, how do we make this transition? Well, for me, there are two or three very definite steps down this road. 
and perhaps the thing that I find most fascinating about it is that above all it's folklorists who are responsible folklorists who are supposed to describe and to analyze tradition in the end not not through any malicious um, acts or irresponsibility but just through a series of chances and ignorance create what I think of as the goblinification of the boggit, that the boggit narrows down to a house spirit. Now, I said before that a boggit can be a ghost, um, it can be a shape changer, it can be um, a black dog, um, it can be a demon. Um, a boggit can also be a house spirit. Um, we have several examples where the word boggit is used to describe a spirit living or dwelling in a house. Um, uh, so th there's no problem with that definition. The, the difficulty is the way that Boggett's become exclusively that in later folklore writing and then in post-war popular culture. So how on earth does this happen? Well, I think the story begins in the very late 1820s with a Lancashire man named John Roby. John Roby was one of our first folklore writers in England. Um, he decided to write a series of three volumes on what he called the traditions of Lancashire. And what John Roby did was he picked a series of, I, I think it's 39 different folklore stories from the county, and he then fictionalised these. And they're, they're rather difficult things to read today. They're, they're very frustrating for anyone interested in Northwestern folklore, because it's never clear how much is folklore and how much is John Roby telling a good story. Now, Roby was a very, um, let's say, astute individual. And for simple, what we would call today, marketing reasons, he bullied an acquaintance, Thomas Crofton Croker, in London, into writing one of these stories. Um, now, Thomas Crofton Croker is a figure who is far more important than John Roby um, in European folklore, because he, earlier on in the 1820s, had written the fairy traditions of the south of Ireland, um, a, a very successful work that eventually was published over three volumes and about which a great deal could be said. Um, Thomas Crofton Croker had been very successful in that venture and Roby wanted to, to some extent, to use his success by including a story by Thomas Crofton Croker in the volume. Um, <clears throat> he gave Thomas Crofton Croker a series of options uh, and Croker very foolishly in an interview had said yes to this. And we're lucky enough that in Cork Library there are still surviving the letters from John Roby badgering um, poor old Thomas Crofton Croker to actually provide a story. Now, Thomas Crofton Croker was clearly desperate. He just wanted to get this off his desk. And at this point, he came across one of the very few examples of a story about a boggit uh, that then existed. And this is the, the famous story of the flitting house spirit. Um, this is a story I think you'll all know. Um, essentially, the a family angers a house spirit. The house spirit starts to cause them trouble. Um, and at the end, the family flit or flee. This is a story found all the way through Northern Europe and all through Northern and the Midlands of England. Um, and the family decide to flee. They wake up very early in the morning and they're going down the road and, and suddenly it emerges that the house spirit begins speaking to them from the luggage. The house spirit is coming with them. Um, now, this story um, was had already been published with the Boggit in. Uh, as I said before, Boggit's a generic word. It could be applied to a house spirit. It could be applied to a ghost. It could be applied to a, a mermaid. It, it was possible to apply it to all kinds of different creatures. Um, and what happens at this point is that Thomas Crofton Croker takes the pre-published story and there is no other word, I think, for what he does, plagiarises it shamelessly. Um, he takes the story, um, he copies it out, and I think I'm right in saying that of 1,100 words, 600 words are simple word-for-word -word quotation from the original story. Um, and he s sets it in Boggit Hole Clough, which is a creepy place, or was then a creepy place, 
to the north of Manchester. Now, I'll be talking about Boggett Hole Clough in a few minutes. But for our purposes, what matters is that Thomas Crofton Croker got this off his desk by applying this story that had, in one instance, involved the word Boggett and applied it to Boggett Hole Clough. Um, John Roby also seems to have intervened in the editorial process. And the result was that in 1829, a story called The Boggett or the Bar Guest was published by Roby in the traditions of Lancashire. And the traditions of Lancashire went on to become, if not a bestseller, certainly a very important book. Um, it was still being reprinted in a reduced Bowdlerized form in the 1920s. So it went through an entire century of print runs. And that story became the Lancashire Boggett story. There's a degree of natural selection going on here. Um, Lancashire is and certainly in the 19th century, was an indispensable part of England, the industrial heartlands. Uh, but it's a long way from the London-centric members um, uh, who, who are of what became the Folklore Society. So from the 1850s, those individuals in the capital who were starting to write what we would recognise as folklore. And <clears throat> one of the consequences of this is that when people in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s in London uh, are reading about Northwestern folklore, they come across this house spirit. Um, and I'm just going to put up now an image um, from Roby's book, um, which shows the boggit um, involved in his mischief. And this was the image that people who were writing national folklore and who tended to be based out of London were using that they knew the Boggett was a house spirit. It was that simple. No one gave a more generic definition. Um, and while Roby certainly knew what a Boggett was, I doubt very much that Thomas Croft and Croker could have given a definition. The result of all this is that the Boggett has become, in the minds of Southern folklorists, a house spirit. And this is not helped by the great writers um, of Lancashire folklore movement. Now, Lancashire was arguably the first English county to really start writing folklore. The golden age of Lancashire folklore stretches from, let's say, about 1850, 1845 through to 1870. And in that period, four or five Lancashire writers um, wrote monographs. All of them touched on boggets. But all of them, first of all, dwelt on Roby's Boggett, even though this was a plagiarised story and it actually came from Yorkshire. Um, and secondly, they included other Boggets, but they were naturally drawn, let's say, to perhaps more spectacular, dramatic forms of Boggets. And again, anyone reading about Boggets in London, um, in the Folklore Society and not knowing the North West well, would have assumed that Boggets were a fairly dramatic form of house spirit. The most common boggets in the Northwest, and I've collected two or three hundred instances of local boggets, is that boggets are ghosts. They're simply forms of the undead. Um, in most of the English supernatural, the ghost is the most popular form, and this is absolutely no exception when we come to boggets um, more generally. Um, it, most boggets are ghosts, um, and yet this was completely lost touch with in the writing of folklorists from Lancashire and folklorists from further south particularly from the capital just didn't have the context to understand that Boggett had this wider sense and they focused in on the story that Roby had popularised Thomas Crofton Croker's plagiarised Yorkshire tale um, and they gave that as the description of the Boggett. Now, I just want to give at this point my favourite image of a boggit um, from the 19th century Northwest. Here you see a young man who is out at night and there is a looming supernatural presence somewhere in the background. And in the best tradition of horror writers um, and um, the, the supernatural generally, what's fascinating about this figure is we don't really see it. We get a hint through the, the mist as this young man terrified runs off. And for me, this is the real answer to the house goblin Boggett that became so popular in Roby um, and that we'll see 
um, publicised right through the century. And here you see um, the, the young man running away after coming into contact with something supernatural, something horrible. This is the boggit of the 19th century imagination. Now, I described a process um, whereby folklorists to the south who were great writing at this date the great works of national folklore absorbed this idea that a boggit was some kind um, of house goblins, some kind of house spirit. Um, this was compounded by the work of a Victorian children's writer. Um, and this woman is Juliana Horatia Ewing. And in 1864, excuse me, 1865, Ewing published a short story that was to have a very long life and immense influence. And this short story is called The Brownies. Now, in the story, she describes a situation whereby in a house, in a given house, there is a spirit named a brownie who helps families. And these brownies are really a way that Juliana Hiroshi Ewing is describing the work of children in a house. And the brownies go around, they clean things up, they help their parents. But sometimes you have bad or spoiled brownies, and these are boggits. Um, and the boggit is the bad brownie. Um, and if you recognise this from the definition that I gave you of Catherine Briggs earlier, then this is absolutely not an accident. These two things, um, these two things go together. Catherine Briggs, for reasons I'll soon explain, got her definition of boggit not from 19th century folklore writers, but from rather um, saccharine 19th century children's writer. I'll read you one of the passages describing this tension between the brownie and the boggit in Ewing's short story. The brownie, or as they are sometimes called, the small folk, the little people or the good people, are a race of tiny beings who domesticate themselves in a house of which some grown-up human being pays the rent and taxes. They are like small additions of men and women. They are too small and fragile for heavy work. They have not the strength of a man, but are a thousand times more fresh and nimble. They can run and jump and roll and tumble with marvellous agility and endurance, and of many of the aches and pains which men and women grow under, groan under, they do not even know the names. They have no trade or profession, and as they live entirely upon other people, they know nothing of domestic cares. In fact, they know very little upon any subject, though they are often intelligent and highly inquisitive. They love dainties, play and mischief. They are apt to be greatly beloved and are themselves capriciously affectionate. They are little people and can do only little things. When they are idle and mischievous, they are called boggets and are a curse to the house they live in. When they are useful and considerate, they are brownies and are a much coveted blessing. Sometimes the blessed brownies will take up their abode and some worthy couple cheer them with their romps and merry laughter, tidy the house, find things that have been lost and take little troubles out of hands full of great anxieties. Now, um, this story really caught on in the late Victorian imagination. It was republished again and again, uh, first in journals, then in a collection of Ewing's work. I, I should say that Ewing herself came from Boggatdom, um, or rather she spent part of her early life there. Her father was a clergyman. She certainly knew what the word Boggat meant, but she manipulated it in a sensible way in this story to create this idea of the good child versus the bad child. Now, this story would, in the normal course of things, have died the death of a great deal of Victorian children literature that, generally speaking, was not very readable after, say, the Great War. But here, just one of these freaks of popular culture, um, a gentleman named Baden-Powell, Lord Baden-Powell, learnt about this story and became very keen on it. And Lord Baden-Powell was, of course, the founder of the Scout Movement. Um, after the First World War, Baden-Powell had been encouraged to set up an equivalent to the Scouts, which was a boy-only venture, was a male venture. Um, and he set up a, a group of girls and he eventually gave them the name The Brownies. 
And in brownie mythology, there was constantly this sense that you as a brownie, so as an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old little girl, had to be good. You had to be someone who would look after your family um, and who would not be a boggart. And right the way through, from the 1920s through to the 1960s, Hundreds of thousands of young British women and young women living in the Dominions, so Newfoundland, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, um, other spots, uh, other English speaking spots around the world, were, were constantly given references to boggets and brownies. And the result of this was that um, the result of this was that the, the very idea of boggit became quite popular in English culture. And it was these as a house goblin that young English girls um, learnt about this word. And very often at Brownies, they would play games where, for instance, um, one game that comes to mind, a rope would be whirled around and around in the circle and the Brownies would have to jump as the rope came round. And if the rope caught you, it meant the boggit had got you. OK, so in this sense, Boggett was vividly impressed as this slightly nasty creature dwelling down in the cellar um, into the minds um, of all these girls who, of course, grew up to be young women. And this matters terribly in English folklore because Brownie uh, and Boggett was picked up upon by one of the centuries most famous girl guide leaders, Catherine Briggs, a great folklorist who I quoted from at the beginning. And for example, this nonsensical idea that has no foundation at all in folklore, that a spirit called a brownie became a spirit called a boggit um, in English folklore and Scottish folklore, comes from Catherine, Bra Catherine Briggs taking these ideas unfiltered um, from her years in the Girl Guides. And in defence of Catherine Briggs, Catherine Briggs did actually, um, at the beginning, write her fairy dictionaries, her fairy lists, as a way of interesting um, young girls in the Girl Guide movement. So that's where that comes from. Um, now, how does this affect our, our situation with boggets? Well, we have this generic Northwestern term that then becomes the house goblin in not Lancashire tradition, but the tradition of Lancashire folklore writing that's picked up in that way by the national folklorists in London. And that, that is then reinforced um, by this short story that then has an afterlife as it leaks out into the Girl Guides movement. And then there's this incredible feedback uh, that Catherine Briggs picks up on in her own writing. And it's difficult for someone uh, from outside of Britain to just get a sense of how influential Catherine Briggs has been, not just in folklore, but in popular culture more generally. Her books were very widely read and are seen as being very authoritative. I'll just give you here, um, before moving on to the final part of this talk, an image from um, Ewing's book. This is the first collected volume that included this short story, showing us a brownie uh, before the brownie transformed into the evil boggit. When I was doing research on the boggit, um, one of the most valuable collections of sources I, I was able to find was um, a, a research project that I did on the site called the Boggit Census. Um, the Boggit Census was an attempt to gather in from people who had grown up in the 1970s or before, um, from the areas that I showed on the map at the beginning of this talk, Boggatdom, um, what they meant by the word Boggit. Um, and in the end, I was able to gather in about 1,100 people who were, um, say, in their late 40s or younger, um, and who had grown up in these areas, and who, in two thirds of the cases, had some kind of impression about what boggets were um, and in other cases um, about a third of the responses just had never heard the word bogget. It was one of these instances where negatives for me were useful. Now the purpose of looking at boggets in 
popular tradition in this way was just really an attempt to chart the death of the Boggit um, through the old Boggit lands. And um, quite what happened to the Boggit there is in itself a fascinating story. And for me, perhaps my favourite chapter in the book I've just published with University of Exeter Press. Um, I should say that this Boggit census is available in a companion volume um, called the Boggit Source Book, and that costs um, a certain amount of money. Uh, you can purchase that from Exeter, but it's also free online. Um, and I will make sure that anyone who is interested has access to this. If you have any problems or you just want a copy, please write to me and I'll gladly pass this on. Um, and it includes this 90,000 words um, as well uh, from the Boggit census, as well as a lot of ephemera uh, from the 19th century and a compendium of Boggit place names. Now, the reason I'm ending with the Boggit census is what I've tried to do in this talk is show you the way that the Boggit has gone from being a folk word in 19th century tradition through to taking on a life of its own in popular culture um, via um, short stories, via a certain process of filtering within folklore tradition or the tradition of folklore writing, let's say, and also the way that Boggett took on a life of its own in the Girl Guides movement. That, after the Second World War, um, went back um, and began to have payoff in the sense that a series of young adult authors and children's authors started to write about boggets in different ways. Um, there were literally tens of authors who include uh, boggets in their stories for teenagers and for kids. Um, and the most famous of these is J.K. Rowling, who includes um, a very unique take on the boggit in Harry Potter. And of course, that in turn has gone through to films. Um, the Spiderwick Chronicles, for example, a fantasy film from, I think, the early 2000s. I hope I've got that right. Um, has a, a wonderful house spirit, uh, which is a brownie. But if the brownie, for whatever reason, is made angry, it turns into a bog. It's a horrible little goblinoid creature. Uh, and I think I'm right in saying that you can only tame uh, a bog it, according to the film and the, the writers of the book that stands behind it, by giving the brownie, uh, excuse me, giving the bog it honey. Now, if this, um, I, I hope this gives you a sense of the way that the popular culture Boggit is caught on. But of course, generally speaking, this doesn't exist at the level of folklore in the, the popular tradition of a group or particularly not in the popular tradition of the given area. There is one place, though, where exceptionally something like this has caught on within a local community. Um, to the north of Manchester, or rather in the north of the conurbation, there is an area called Boggett Hole Clough. Now, Boggett Hole Clough is a, today it's a large, wild park. I think it's about 170 acres. Um, and in the past, it had, in the early 19th century, this rather scary name. Boggett Hole would be the lair of the Boggett. Um, and there were, there were lots of these in the northwest, so the place name in itself is not so interesting. But this area was absorbed into the conurbation as Manchester ballooned out um, in the in the um, 20, well, in the late 19th, in the mid and the late 19th century, and in the 20th century, and it, it became englobed within Manchester. So it's a little bit like if you look at a, a Google map image, it's like a London park. It's this wonderful island of green surrounded by terrace housings, uh, terrace housing. And what's fascinating about Boggett Hole Clough is that, well, first of all, Boggett Hole Clough is very famous in the Northwest. Um, it was traditionally a place where political speeches were given. It also has a couple of sport grounds, so it always was appearing in newspapers. But secondly, it was a place where the uh, tired and weary of Manchester on Saturday and Sunday would take their kids to, to have a little bit of a, an experience of green away from the sometimes rather grotty centre. Um, and the result of this is that generations of kids have grown up going to this place with this very peculiar name. And it's a lovely example of how a place name has 
demanded an explanation. Whereas kids in, for example, Liverpool, the city to the west of Manchester that also had its boggets, have completely forgotten the sense of what a boggit is. Um, in Manchester, the, the word boggit still means something because of boggit hole clough. And when I was doing the boggit census, I was absolutely fascinated um, at the way that Boggett survived in Manchester because of Boggett Hole Clough. In other words, lots of people in the conurbation, one of Britain's very biggest cities, remember, knew what Boggetts were because of Boggett Hole Clough. The interesting thing was, though, that they had abandoned the old Victorian generic sense of Boggett. And this is the one part of the country where something like the house goblin Boggett had taken over. Um, I had references in the Boggett census to children who'd gone to the park in the 50s and who knew that there were Boggetts hiding in the trees. Um, and you very much have descriptions of small black goblinoid creatures. I also had a wonderful mother's description from 2019 about when she takes her kids to the park, she still scares them with stories of the Boggetts that are lurking there. Um, and so Manchester is one of the few places in the Northwest where the word boggit has survived, albeit with a different meaning. There are also in the Northwest places where the traditional sense of boggit has survived. And this is something that when I started the boggit census in 2019, I would never, never have believed. But in northern Derbyshire, in some parts of Lancashire beyond the Ribble, there are still places where people give you the traditional sense of Boggett. And what I've done here, I'm going to give you a final map from my book showing the places that the word Boggett has survived um, to some degree or other. Um, and looking at the way... Um, that in much of what used to be Boggatdom, the lands of the Boggat, the word has really just disappeared or um, become a word for the erudite. Um, whereas in some parts of Lancashire, northern Derbyshire, the word has survived with a traditional sense, though of course that will rapidly die out. But in the area around Boggat Hole Clough and Manchester more specifically, the word Boggat is still known. And I hope from this map, um, however crude it will seem, you get some sense of that. So you have a story of survival and continuity in parts of the Northwest, particularly the rural and rather untouched parts of the Northwest. But in Manchester, you have perhaps what's always the most exciting thing for me in the supernatural, continuity with change. 